So this class is a more perfect you, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson number nine in this uh, series. Three sets of spiritual fruit, and we're in Galatians chapter five, if, you, if you're following along in your Bibles. As I said, this is the last lesson in our series. Uh, and uh, because it is, I'd like to um, uh, review some of the concepts that we've studied surrounding this passage in Galatians chapter five and then finish with a brief description of the final words Paul uses to describe the life in the spirit or walking in the spirit, okay? So let's do a little bit of review. So Paul in this letter is defending against false teachers who threaten the spiritual stability of this church and he does so by promoting the idea that in order to retain one's perfect and sanctified standing before God, rather the false teachers were promoting the idea that in order to retain one's perfect and sanctified standing before God, a person had to adhere to a mix of religious and philosophical ideas and practices, and here's the key, dictated by these teachers, the chief teaching being mandatory circumcision. That's what was going on. Paul writes this letter to refute their claims and he explains to the Galatians that their perfect and sinless status before God is maintained not by adhering to man-made religious practices. That standing is maintained by a sincere submission to the Holy Spirit motivated by their faith in Christ. And then it goes on to show that the best protection against falling back into the world and its fleshly sins and works is to aggressively walk with or walk in the spirit. Now I've explained that Christians submit and walk in the spirit when they do several things because that was a question. Okay, I get it. Uh, what do I shoot for in my Christian walk to, to maintain my salvation, to grow in Christ? What do I do? And, and, and the answer is walk in the spirit. How do I do that? You know, nuts and bolts. How do I do that? Well, we walk in the spirit when we submit to the spirit and we submit to him when we submit to his word. In other words, reading his word, obeying his word, that's submission to the spirit. Unfortunately, in our, in our society, when we talk about the Spirit or the Holy Spirit, it always tends to become a very emotional thing, a, mis a mysterious thing, apparitions and feelings and so on and so forth, but that's not what the Bible teaches concerning the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit means you're submitting to His Word. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. We study the Word and we try our best to do what the Word says. Submitting to His power, following the path that the Spirit leads us in life by the choices that we make. Oh, choices that we make, based on what? Well, based on His Word, based on what we understand His Word to, to say, how His Word is applied in a particular situation. We don't always get it right, we don't have perfect insight, but the more we read, the more we study, the more we learn, the better our decisions with time. And of course, we submit to His ministry. In other words, we allow the Spirit to work in us through trials, through the correction of other people, through the influence of the church on our lives. I mean, the hardest thing, listen, the hardest thing is to be corrected. Nobody likes it. No one likes to be corrected, but sometimes we have to be corrected. When a brother or a sister or an elder or a teacher, whatever, uh, takes us aside and, and says, brother, sister, this area in your life is hurting you spiritually. You, you need to kind of change this habit, change this thing. Uh, that, nobody likes to hear that because we don't want to be told what to do. We want to be in charge of ourselves. You know, nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, if you're a Christian, you better get used to <laughs> people telling you what to do, especially the Spirit of God and many times telling you to do something that you don't necessarily enjoy doing, or giving up something you don't necessarily want to give up, or acting in a way that is difficult, that goes contrary to our nature. But all of this is part of being in submission to the Spirit of God. So we don't produce the fruit of the Spirit through self-will, or trying a practice, or positive thinking, 
That's not how the spirit, uh, that's not how the fruit of the spirit is perfected in us, is, is, is developed in us. It's the Holy Spirit that creates these things in us as we submit to Him in the ways that I've just described. The deeper and fuller our submission, the more productive our spiritual fruit. The fruit is the goal, submission to the Holy Spirit is the means. I mean, isn't that what the life of Jesus teaches us? I mean, when he goes into the garden, in the end, why would he have to say, not my will, but thy will be done? Whose will, who, whose will was he talking about? His human will, remember, he was fully human. Do you think for a moment that his human side wanted to go to the cross? I mean, the prayer was, surely there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> Surely there's got to be a plan B to save mankind, you know, that I don't have to be whipped and scourged and, and tortured and then brutally murdered. Surely there's got to be a better way. The fact that he goes back three times demonstrates he was fully human and his humanity was saying no. But in the end, he realized, okay, not my will, your will. Well, you know what? That scenario plays itself out in our lives as well. I mean, it's not you know, going to the cross and being tortured and murdered, although some Christians have suffered that and suffer that even today. We read about it more and more, don't we? That Christians are being uh, you know, uh, tortured and killed and run out of countries even. But on a lesser scale, you know, the Spirit is saying to us, you know, this, this, the, way you're, the way you're treating your wife or your husband or the way you're treating yourself or your body, that's got to change. And we say, oh, not that. Oh, I can't do this. Same thing. Jesus gave us the example with the ultimate submission, and that is submitting to the Father in giving up His life for us. Okay, so today we're going to finish with the last spiritual fruit mentioned by Paul in Galatians chapter five. So let's go to the passage itself. Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Notice the symmetry here. The way Paul puts you know, the words together. When he lists the fruit of the Spirit, he mentions nine things. Actually, three groups of three virtues which fit well with each other within their own particular group. So the first three are love, joy, peace. They fit together, those, that triad. Love, of course, the willful desire to treat others as God has treated us in Christ. The crowning virtue of the Christian religion. Doesn't Paul tell us that the goal of our instruction is love? If, 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 if we are not becoming more loving type people through our instruction of the Bible, then we're not, getting, you know, we're not getting the right instruction. The teacher's not shooting for the right goal. The willful desire, I, you know, the Christian love, agape love, remember, based on a decision, not a feeling. I love my wife was based on a feeling. I was attracted to my wife. She was attracted to me, that feeling. I got to be near her, I got to have her, right? It's all feeling, that's, that's fine, that's good. But Christian love isn't based on a feeling. Or I love my mom, you know, or I love my dad, my uncle. You know, he's a little crazy, but you know, we love him anyways. Because you know, he's family. Christian love is based on a decision. I'm going to love you and it doesn't matter how you are. Tall, short, big, small, fe female, male, nice to me, not so nice to me. I'm going to love you because this is what God requires of me as a Christian. Agape love is love based on a decision. Joy, the happiness we experience when we recognize and accept the grace 
that is ours because of God's love for us in Christ. You know, joy is a, I was going to say tricky, and I don't like to use the word tricky, but it's, it's difficult to, to grasp that. It's not the same thing as happy. It's not the same thing as, happy is my birthday, you know. Whoa, Xbox or Z-Box, whatever they're selling now. You know, whoa, I got what I want. Whoa, a new rifle, you know, that's happy. And that's okay, happy is good. But joy is completely out of that league because it's not based on stuff. It's not based on things we have or don't have or feelings we have. You know, joy is not that transient happiness that we experience as a result of the blessings we have in life, family, health, success. I'm happy because we have a large family and we have lots of grandkids, you know, I'm happy. But you know what? That's going to pass away. I mean, what parent does not dread losing their child before they pass away, right? You know, I, I've done funerals, Bud has done funerals, you know, for, for young people who passed away, sudden heart attack at 40 years of age, somebody dies, and that person's parent, they always say the same thing, right? What do they say? It's not supposed to work that way. I'm supposed to go first. I never planned on burying my child. So that's, that's a, every parent's worst nightmare. And that's what I'm saying, you know, having a family, that's happiness, but down at the back of your mind, you know that that's transient, that's just in passing. Because even family, we lose even family after, after a time. Joy is the natural experience that comes from contemplating our salvation and the blessings that stem from it. That's joy, that's where joy comes in. The more we grow in our confidence that we're going to heaven. The more we grow in our confidence that God actually loves us, that His love surpasses any idea of the kind of love that we could exhibit. That's joy. Joy comes to us when we finally accept the fact that all of our sins are forgiven. Every single one of them are forgiven, gone forever. And of course, Satan, one of Satan's tactics, you know, it's not always a temptation to commit adultery or a temptation to steal or to lie, although those temptations are there. No, you know, for Christians that are more mature, you know, and like you, you couldn't tempt brother so-and-so to cheat on his wife or to steal, you know, this, this brother, this Christian is beyond that type of thing. You know. But you know what? The devil can take away his joy. He can just you know, chop off the high points, you know, just bring you down a point where you, you can't fully appreciate everything that you have in Christ. That's a tactic. He can't destroy your soul, but a lot of times he tries to sabotage your joy. And usually by making you feel guilty about stuff that you shouldn't feel guilty about. And then peace. Peace is the same as assurance, the quietness of the soul, J. R. Linsky in his commentary calls it, that is unmoved despite the trials and tribulations here on earth. Did you ever have, did you ever have that experience? You know, your, your life is burning down around you and somehow you're just like, I'm good, I'm, you know, I'm not liking what's happening and I, you know, I'm anxious for it to stop and I'm going to do everything I can to kind of manage it, but somehow the, the core inside of me is steady, steady as she goes. You know, peace that transcends suffering or fear or, or, or the threat of death. It's a, it's a spiritual balance that we attain as we walk in submission to the Holy Spirit. If, if, you want to, if you want to cultivate courage, you don't go to martial arts class. That's, that has all of its good points, martial arts. You know. But if you really want to develop courage, you have to have peace first. <laughs> because peace is a, a courage is an outgrowth of peace. If you're at peace with God and at peace with yourself, what exactly are you going to be afraid of? 
Note that these three, love, joy, peace, refer to the inner and singular experience that those who follow the Spirit enjoy. Love, joy, peace, that's, that's, that goes on inside of me. Now one could enjoy and perceive these based on the mediation of his soul, on the, the, excuse me, the meditation of his soul on the greatness and mercy of God. The more I know God, the more I actually know God, the more love I am capable of expressing, the more joy that comes into my soul, the greater peace I have. The Spirit fashions these virtues mainly through the knowledge of God and the revelation of the gospel to us. Knowing of God's mercy and salvation in Christ, having this truth pressed into our minds and hearts engenders our own godlike love, provokes joy in our spirit and establishes a peace that goes beyond human understanding. I don't know about you, but I never get tired of hearing the gospel. I never get tired of hearing messages on the gospel because I mean, you could hear a hundred sermons in a row about the gospel, they'll all be different, but somehow they're all the same. And yet, you know, I never get tired of apple pie and ice cream. My wife's apple pie and ice cream, I never get tired of it. I mean, I don't, I don't eat it three times a day, but you know, when she makes it, I'm happy. Imagine the gospel, the food of life. I never get tired of it. Love, joy, peace, the initial fruit produced in the spirit of one saved by Christ and led by the spirit. We make all kinds of litmus tests for finding out who are the legitimate disciples and who are the true biblical Christians. But sometimes we resolve tricky issues by saying, well, only God can see a person's heart. <laughs> well, and that's true. But I'll tell you, when God looks into the person's heart, if there's no love, joy, peace created by faith in Christ, it doesn't matter what other credential that person has, he doesn't pass the test. <laughs> you can be sitting in the pew all you want, but if there's no love, joy, peace growing there, What do they say? Just because you're sitting in the chicken coop doesn't make you a chicken? Something like that. So we're not in the spirit if the fruit of the spirit isn't in us to a certain degree. There are degrees, obviously, that come with maturity and experience. The second group that Paul mentions are patience, kindness, goodness. So the first of these, patience, some of your Bibles say long-suffering, that quality of being where the mind holds out long before giving way to action. I repeat it. That quality of being where the mind holds out before giving away to action. Patience is the willingness to bear under trial and inconvenience unkindness and other forms of personal provocation without losing one's composure in Christ. Why do you think patience is the greatest requirement to raise small children? <laughs> right, because small children wear you out physically and provoke you to action before you think things through sometimes. In one who is patient, there can be all kinds of provocation, but the spirit of that person holds out quietly. We see that in Jesus, don't we? All the provocation, and yet he held, he held out. I'm going to use my children again to make, a, make an, a, a point here. I can even include my son-in-law now, but I'm, we're, we're really getting to it. He's been in the family many years, so he's, he's, he's due to get one now. So. Paul and Julia and uh, uh, Mauricio, of course, uh, they used to tell me stories about their training in the Marines when they were at boot camp and how the worst failure was to lose what they were referring to as their bearing, to maintain their bearing. 
And so they would tell me they were provoked mercilessly by their drill instructors for months in an effort to teach them how to endure all kinds of psychological and physical attacks without losing their bearing, their composure, their calmness. Sometimes the DI would humiliate a certain Marine in order to get the others in the group to laugh at that guy. But even their laughter was considered a loss of bearing and thus a failure on their part. Of course, this training would become crucial in actual combat where each soldier would have to maintain their composure, their bearing, when surrounded by casualties and chaos. Keeping one's bearing would mean the difference between life or death, or victory or defeat. Well, it's the same thing in spiritual warfare. Keeping one's spirit in check is often the difference between spiritual life or a fall into deadly sinfulness and the pain and sorrow that comes with it. Maintaining our bearing, keeping a check on our spirit. Patience, kindness, kindness well disposed, sweet, gracious. A synonym for this word is the word benign, something that harbors no danger, no disease. In other words, kindness is a disposition of character that is best seen in generosity. Kind people are generous, not just with money, they're generous with all things, with their time, with their praise, with their encouragement. It's the opposite of mean-spirited, cheap, legalistic, narrow. The kind person is aware, very much aware, of what God has done for him and is moved to largesse. That's why, the, that's why the first fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, comes from our contemplation of God's work in our life. The more we think about, read about, pray about, give thanks for those things, the greater our knowledge and our awareness of the Spirit, God's Spirit, in our life and in the life around us. And that awareness then begins to generate these other things, patience. You know, if God is with me, who can be against me? If I'm going to be with God, well, they can go ahead and kill the body, but they can't kill my spirit. You know, that kind of courage, that kind of courage breeds patience and kindness. I can't help being generous when I understand how generous God has been with me. When we begin to understand that we don't deserve a thing that we have, I mean, we don't. Especially us in this country, I mean, that we were born here with all the advantages that this just being born here gives us, the education, the medical you know, uh, uh, system that we have, and, the freedom to move about. I, I remember a time when I was uh, teaching uh, three women on Skype. You know, um, I was teaching them the Bible, actually teaching them English to speak English, and then we'd be an hour. They were all in China. They lived in different cities in China, and we would kind of get together and we would study together. And it was fascinating. The first half hour or so, we'd talk about grammatical things, and I'd get them to talk about their life as a way of you know, practicing their English. And then the second half hour, we'd read the Bible and they'd ask questions about the Bible. And I found it fascinating. I mean, uh, one, one lady was saying, well, she was waiting for her permit so she could move to another city. <laughs> you didn't have freedom of movement. All the type of things, you know, the permit, the, 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 the party, the, and, and they were very guarded on top of that about what they said. They were very, you know, oh, it's wonderful here, you know, but you could read between the lines the control that the government had on them. I mean, just something as simple as you know, picking up and getting rid of that apartment and moving to this other city. Oh no, you had to go get a permission to do that. One lady had a, a, a small child, a baby. She had just had a baby and, and uh, the idea, well, we'd like to have another, and then there was silence. 
well, of course this was several years back. We'd like to have another. However, it's against the law to have another baby. We'll have to go get permission. We have to get a permission and pay to, so that my husband and I can have another child. So I'm telling you, we, we don't know how good we have it. We marry who we want, live where we want, do what we want, work, what, not work. Government will support us. So uh, my point, when we realize all the spiritual and physical blessings that we have, it can't help but make us generous towards others. And then uh, goodness, this third virtue listed in the second group is very similar to kindness, goodness. The main difference is that this word refers to what a person actually does rather than any level of moral excellence. So goodness wants good for others, is interested in the plight of others, does good things for the good of others. Kindness is about attitude. Goodness is more about acts. Kindness is about how you think and how you are. Goodness is more about what you do. Now, these three, patience, kindness, goodness, are less contemplative virtues and have more to do with a person's relationship with other people. So the first three, love, joy, peace, that's me, that's inside me, that's how I am. Patience, kindness, goodness is how I act towards other people. Of course, one who experiences love, joy, peace will soon cultivate patience, kindness, goodness, because one stems from the other. Love, joy, peace are manifestations of God's love in our soul. Patience, kindness, goodness are manifestations of God's love in our dealings with other people. The Holy Spirit provides the gospel revelation to produce the first group, and he provides opportunities and teaching and discipline to produce the second group. All right, the third group that Paul mentions are faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Faithfulness, now there are many forms for the words faith and faithfulness that refer to various things, as we know. Faith, for example, in the Greek, uh, can refer to doctrine, the faith. What faith are you? Are you of the Hindu faith? Are you of the Christian faith? You know, what doctrine, what teaching? The faith. Or it can mean trust or belief. I have faith in you, meaning I trust you. Okay? Could mean that, same word. Or it could be someone who is faithful, trustworthy, loyalty. It can mean loyalty. In this case, faithfulness here, it means that one is faithful or true to God and His word and his will, as well as to human obligations and relationship. In other words, a faithful friend, a faithful Christian, a faithful spouse. I love what Marty says. Uh, he said it several times. Um, you know, he says, I'm not a perfect spouse, I'm not a perfect husband, but I am a faithful husband. A wonderful insight, a wonderful idea to hold on to. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a perfect Christian, but I'm a faithful one. See, see the difference? And God is not asking us to be perfect because He knows we can't be, not in this human form. That's why He's prepared a glorified body for us. But we are able to be faithful. That we can do. We can do that, being faithful. Okay? In this world of lies and broken promises, a person who is faithful stands out and is especially effective if his faithfulness is to Christ and His love. Gentleness, the next one refers to one who is not preoccupied with self. One who is not bent on having his will, her will done at all costs. Jesus' meekness was evident when he accepted God's will over his own in going to the cross. Meekness is not weakness. It rhymes, but it's not the same thing. Meekness is rooted in strength and the knowledge that one has access to power. And here's my positive you know, example as far as martial arts. Many martial arts masters rarely use their strength 
knowing that their superior fighting technique is what gives them the strength to walk away from a confrontation. I've never taken courses, but from those who have, they tell me one of the things that we're taught is to walk away. We have the strength and the ability to, take, to defend ourselves and to put a, you know, to hurt the other guy if we really want to. And it's the knowledge of that strength and ability that enables us to say, hey, I don't want any trouble, I'll walk away. I don't have to prove anything. And so a meek person will not seek his own will for its own sake, rather he will submit his own will for God's will in the pursuit of what is best for the other person or for the entire group. The soldier that, you know, uh, that says, I'll stay and I'll hold this position while you people fall back, knowing that he or she is risking being killed. In that moment, say, no, you guys get back, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll cover you, knowing he may be overwhelmed, not be able to make it back. But what is he showing there? Well, courage, but that courage comes from what? It comes from meekness. It comes from meekness, the, willing to, the willingness to desire someone else's you know, goodness better than our own, sacrificing our own. So gentle people are not about winning the war or the debate or the argument or the point or the issue. They are about winning the peace, winning the favor of God, enabling others to win, to live. And then self-control, of course, the key ingredient in a person's relationship with himself. The virtue of self-control determines the rate of a person's growth in Christ and the quality of his or her self-image. Self-control is the virtue around which the struggle between the spirit and the flesh that Paul talks about in Romans 7 uh, revolves. You know, when he says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I do, I don't want to do. That's every human being, that's every Christian struggle. What's at the center of that? Well, the struggle for self-control. It is the ability to maintain the boundaries set for us by God in our thoughts, words, and deeds. God has set a boundary for us. You know, he, he's, he's given us, I mean, the, the most logical one, not logical, but the most obvious one, he's given all human beings, you know, uh, 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 a sex drive, the ability to enjoy human sexual intimacy. He's given that, the God invented that. <laughs> he didn't have to. You know, we could have just shaken hands and had a baby. <laughs> but no, he, he designed an intimacy and, and, and he designed pleasure, right? However, he put, a, he put boundaries around that. He said, yes, I give you this, but this here is to be enjoyed within this boundary here, the boundary of marriage. So the very same action, the very same physical action outside of marriage, it's the same action produces all kinds of negative things, guilt and shame and you know, unwanted chill, you know what I'm saying, all kinds. So it's the same thing, for, you know, he created food, he created ice cream, I'm very thankful for it. But there's a boundary, isn't there? Too much of it and you know, too much sugar, too much fat. There are boundaries for things. Self-control is understanding where the boundaries are and, and staying within those boundaries. He created work. I mean, isn't it enjoyable to get a job done? Whatever it is, whether it's a paper report or mowing your lawn or building a, a building or, he created work for us that gives us pleasure. But there's, a, there's a boundaries, right? He also created the Sabbath. There are boundaries, <coughs> there are boundaries. Self-control is the ability to maintain the boundaries set for us by God in our thoughts and words and deeds. It's the inner strength created by the repeated exercise of obedience to God's will that enables us to maintain our spirit in the submission to God's will. Without self-control, we can't love ourselves. 
We can't love other people because love requires that we keep our selfish and sinful impulses in check. Self-control is a spiritual uh, leash with which we can train our impulses to stay within our command. And so when looked at in total, these three sets of virtues address different needs and realities in effective spiritual living. Love, joy, peace describe the experience one has as the Holy Spirit leads us to deeper levels of truth contained in the gospel of Christ. Patience, kindness, goodness describe the outward manifestation of the life of one motivated by the grace of Christ shed in our hearts by the work of the Spirit. And faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are those virtues cultivated by the discipline of the Spirit that enable us to both maintain our salvation and also bear a powerful witness to the grace of God and the gospel of Christ. What, what's the powerful witness? I'm in control of me. That's the powerful witness. And all these produce a dramatic witness that the perfection one has before God through faith in Christ is actually being felt and seen and acted out in one's daily experience as a Christian. In other words, the actual perfection being created in us by the Holy Spirit in the form of these fruit that Paul speaks of is a concrete witness that the conditional perfection we have already received in Christ is really there. So the actual perfection seen in the fruit that we produce is a witness that the conditional perfection is actually there within us. So the false teachers were trying to convince them that their human methods of you know, ritual and law would guarantee their perfection. Paul shows that these false doctrines and ideas pale in comparison to what the Spirit actually accomplishes in those who submit to Him. In other words, a peaceful heart, a quiet spirit, a faithful life were a much greater witness of one's salvation than a mark in one's flesh like circumcision or restrictive food laws. So what, you don't eat pork. <laughs> so what? You know, what does that prove? What does that make you that you don't eat pork? I just, I just picked that. You know. So what, you've been circumcised. Okay, so what? That doesn't prove anything. I don't see anything in that. As a matter of fact, he says that these things produced by the Holy Spirit show their genuineness in the fact that they are in perfect harmony with God's law and they don't diminish or violate or misrepresent it in any way. Unlike the false teachers who had twisted the law and the word to make their teachings actually work. So to summarize, in verse 24 and 5 in the chapter 6, Paul will go on in his description of a life lived by the Spirit showing that the few things mentioned here are not the complete list of spiritual fruit that can and need to be developed in the Christian. Again, a sampling. But for our intent and purpose, we'll stop here and we end the series with these final thoughts. Thought number one, we are perfect in Christ. Oh boy, I wish we would learn that. If this series has taught us anything, has comforted us in any way, it has been in the knowledge that Christ is our perfection and we are perfect because we have a relationship with Him based on faith and that faith has been expressed in repentance and baptism. Rich, poor, sick, well, young, old, whatever. Mature, struggling, knocked back, feeling down, feeling great, the only thing that has any bearing on your perfect standing before God is your relationship with Christ in faith. So long as you continue to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you continue to maintain conditional perfection. In other words, God sees you as perfect and acceptable based on that. Number two, almost done. Satan's greatest weapon is doubt. The false teachers in the first century tried to make the saints doubt the gospel and maybe try another way to be saved. Today we have religious teachers trying to convince us that maybe knowing and using God's name properly, that'll save us. Or following their own personal prophet or secret teaching, that's the way to go. Closer to home, practicing our religion and rituals perfectly will equal perfection before God. Nothing has changed. 
Never doubt that being and remaining in Christ through faith is the true and only way to be perfect and thus permitted entry into the internal heavens. And then finally, true faith is expressed by baptism in Jesus. True repentance is expressed by walking in the Spirit. I, I can't squeeze it down and compress it any tighter than that. Don't ever think that God's grace is upon you because you, you were merely dunked in the water. God's grace is upon those who express their faith in baptism and they express their repentance by turning away from the deeds of the flesh to a life of submission to the Spirit. The sincerity of your faith will be seen in the sincerity of your repentance and your repentance will be evident in the fruit that you will bear through the Spirit. All right, there it is, a more perfect you an imperfect series on spiritual perfection. Thank you for your presence.